Maddie. Maddie. I'm Mike Golick. I'm Jessica Smetana. Welcome to another edition of Golick and Smetty. I'm Mike Golick Sr. She is Jess Smetana and Jess, wow, we have a lot going on, including you and I heading next week to Ireland for the Notre Dame Navy game. How about that? So excited. I have to learn a lot of of phrases to say, Mike. I'm very, I don't know anything. All I know is slancha. Slancha and I'll have another Guinness. That's pretty much all you need to know. I mean, I was there. Fair in, enough. I was there in 2012, me and, me and my wife, for when Mike and Jake were on the team. So uh, bring some rain gear. Um, okay, I have some. It's going to be in the 60s and rainy. It, it, it oh, was like that blessed last relief. Time we were there. It is so hot in Miami. Yes. That sounds amazing. You will get I relief can't wait. for that. And <laughs> we're actually going to do our, our show next week from Ireland. So. We have time to talk about that. We're going to do a Notre Dame preview today with Pete Sampson from The Athletic. Uh, We're going to talk to uh, uh, Rosie White from uh, New Zealand. Uh, She's been on their Olympic teams, their their World Cup teams, and and, and talk about that as we have one of the semifinals that is uh, done with Sweden and Spain. So we'll get to that. But uh, we got to start, I, I think, just in the NFL because NFL is always king, as we know. And a lot going on there from signings to the first full weekend of preseason games that went on. Uh-huh. So I'm wondering what you took out of it. And what I mean by that is what you took out of it from your Pittsburgh Steelers because God knows that's what you're <laughs> going to talk about. I, you know, I didn't take too much out of the Steelers game. They, they, you know, Kenny Pickett is going to be the big question, and he yeah. didn't play very much in that game. Um, if he can, you know, be an A plus player or maybe a B player, I think that would be solid. So we'll see how he turns out. But I, my biggest takeaway is uh, the news that Ezekiel Elliott has has signed with the Patriots now, Mike. So we had we had three signings. Talking about the first two, they're both running backs, Zeke Elliott. Uh, signed with New England and Dalvin Cook finally signed and he signed with the Jets so mm-hmm. uh, we'll get into Zach Martin because he's from Notre Dame and deserves the most talk um, <laughs> but I for Zeke I mean I, I think anytime you change no matter what happens for whatever reason Jess when you leave a team and I left two of them got cut uh, from no got cut by one the Houston Oilers and left voluntarily in free agency from the Philadelphia Eagles to go to the Miami Dolphins because Miami offered more, Philly didn't match, blah, blah, blah. So any reason that you leave a team, you always want to try and prove them wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So the next team you go to, like when I went to Philly, I wanted to play well enough to the Oilers to say we shouldn't have let him go. Well, when I went to Miami, I wanted to make Philly feel like, you know what, you should have equaled the pay, you know? So you always have that thought process um, that, that you want to show them, you know, what, what they missed or what they gave up. And Zeke is obviously in a way, way bigger category than that. Got the big money mm-hmm. uh, in Dallas, even before the quarterback did in Dak Prescott. And now, you know, they bump him aside for Pollard, who he split time with last year. So you want to prove, you know, running backs have the biggest chips on their shoulder, right? Not only to trying to prove yourself, but trying to say, you guys have devalued us. You know, we're the only position going the wrong way in value mm-hmm. over the last couple of years. So they want to reprove themselves. It's a nice room for him to be in with Ramondre Stevenson, who is the starter there now. Not a lot else uh, in that running back room right now. And we are seeing more split time with running backs, right? We're seeing two running back offenses, yeah. maybe except for the Titans where King Henry is always going to be the man. So uh, I think it's a good signing. It's the first place he visited. But we are always wondering, why are these running backs, Dalvin Cook and Zeke, taking trips and visiting but not signing anywhere? And then boom, boom, they sign almost back-to-back. Dalvin Cook gets about, it can be up to $8 million with the Jets. And I think, Jess, that's a bigger signing because I think the Jets have a higher ceiling right now than New England does. And you have Brees Hall, who would have been the offensive rookie of the year, I think, last year, and ended up going to his teammate Garrett Wilson. Brees Hall blew his uh, ACL out. Mm-hmm. Coming back from that, it's always never, it's always takes a little longer. So to have Dalvin Cook there to split time, they say Brees will be ready to go by the beginning of the season. I think that was a monster move to help out, obviously, Aaron Rodgers, their quarterback. Yeah, and they also have Michael Carter on their team, too, who is a 
really solid back in college, and I think it's his second season on the Jets now. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Those are two p- pretty big signings, and now Zach Martin, who was holding out at camp, has uh, signed an extension with the Cowboys. He's, I know, a thought very highly of in the Golick household. So yes. do you think that this is... Oh. This was the contract he he deserves and was you know holding out for. Oh, certainly. And and what was interesting is, and there's always a new precedent, but for the Cowboys, never had Jerry Jones redone a guy's deal with two years left on it. It was always either one year left or obviously a, as a free agent. And Zach was holding out. Zach was getting fined. Zach's fine is like at a million dollars, and they can't rescind it. The new CBA says you can't rescind it, so he has to pay that. But he said it was finally a face-to-face meeting with Jerry Jones that was the difference. You know, he got to explain where he was coming from, and, and he never wanted to play for anybody else. And, he, and Zach is never going to talk in the media. It's just not who he is. Zach is, mm-hmm. probably still has his first dollar and wears, uh, you know, <laughs> has f- five different pair of khakis he switches off during the day. And I don't mean that in a bad way. He is just a, about as down-to-earth guy as can be who is going to be a walk-in first ballot Hall of Famer. So basically what he got, he was owed $27.5 million over the last two years, or this year and next year, none of which was guaranteed, even though this year he would have made that money, but you never know with injury what next year mm-hmm. would have brought. Now it's shifted to $36 million over the next two years, fully guaranteed. So that gives you a little more peace of mind that that second year is fully guaranteed. Take a million dollars off of that because he's going to have to pay the fine. But, I mean, arguably, it, it's between he and Micah Parsons as the best players on that team. Yeah. It's not even a question uh, that those two are the best players on the team. So to get him back, uh, because Dallas is in a fight, I mean, the, the NFC is not deep, and they're one of the top teams, so you want all you, your entire arsenal there. So, yeah, it was a good move for him. I, I, listen, a gutsy one. Listen, he's made a lot of money. But, man, I know in my household, and I'd imagine in yours, knowing you have to pay a million-dollar fine, it damn well better work out for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Notre Dame with Pete Sampson next, who is a Notre Dame writer for The Athletic. Um, maybe we'll ask him what he thinks about Zach Martin's new contract and what to expect from Notre Dame's uh, offensive line this season, Mike. Boy, that, that's a big thing, Jess. I mean, we sit there and, and we look at Notre Dame – they bring in a quarterback from Wake Forest who's thrown like, what, 110 touchdowns. It's been amazing. And, and everybody's like, yes, we have a passing quarterback. And Notre Dame has always been known for their lines of scrimmage, offense and defense. You have two great anchors in Fisher mm-hmm. and Alt. Alt is all on everybody's preseason top lineman list. And he'll be gone after this year. He'll be a high first-round draft pick. He'll play his three years and he'll move on. You have an experienced center. Uh, as well and you got a couple of new guards that you have to work in so you know for those guys to gel it's an important thing you have a great running back room uh, led by Audric Estime who is Jess I'm out here at Notre Dame I've gone to a couple of practices if I were him I'd never have my shirt on in my life I mean the (laughs) dude is put together and and they like I said a deep running back room led by him the question's going to be Who's, you know, take picking up the slap for, slack for a Michael Mayer and your wide receivers, who's going to step up and be that guy mm-hmm. for a quarterback who can throw the ball? So those, I think, are going to be the biggest questions, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Well, we'll see what Pete thinks about that next. <sighs> All right, Pete. I mean, we, we can't say there wasn't uh, an incredible amount of information and things going on in all of college football. Uh, this offseason we will certainly get to some of that conference le- realignment how it affects Notre Dame but let's let's look at Notre Dame first and, and real general right off the top to you in looking at the team so far this year what's been the biggest difference in Marcus Freeman probably from the head coaching standpoint from last year's first year to this year's second year I think it's the confidence that he has a quarterback and it's not a sort of projected we're hoping this Tyler Buckner works out or we're gonna you know make their offense work around Drew Pine it's you have Sam Hartman you're gonna let it rip Um, he's somebody that you believe in 100% Um, I think the fact that he was voted a captain by his teammates despite being here for what seven months says a ton about 
how he's viewed in the locker room. I already know how he's viewed by the coaching staff. And so that, um, you know, Marcus has grown a ton, right? How could you not after year one and, and sort of the scar tissue that they picked up? But I think the biggest change in Marcus Freeman and from year one to year two will, the, will be the confidence that he has in the guy playing quarterback for him. And that, I think, is that should show immediately against Navy and Dublin. I think it's something that we've picked up on quite a bit um, in terms of watching training camp over the last couple of weeks. So one of the biggest storylines outside of Hartman transferring to ND this offseason was Tommy Reese leaving ND. And I think Tommy Reese was one of the reasons that Hartman felt pretty confident in Notre Dame. So after the whole Andy Ludwig saga and the offensive coordinator search, how are how are people feeling about Jared Parker as the offensive coordinator? It's his first time in the position at Notre Dame, and he's got a, a lot to work with, with Sam Hartman and Audric Estime and a pretty good O-line. Yeah, I think people are confident in him. Um, I don't think that Parker is going to have sort of like those, those, mom- those like X's and O's moments in games where, you know, Reese would be able to scheme up a wide receiver running totally wide open uncovered because of like the, the sort of chess he was playing, um, you know, in the series leading up to it. But I think, I think Parker knows what he has offensively with Estime and Hartman and Alton Fisher at offensive tackle and tight end room should be good. But, um, he, you know, his background, he's, he's done up tempo, high speed offense. He's done, pro style West coast stuff. Uh, he's done RPO stuff. So he's, he's done a little bit of everything. Um, but his approach really is not that different from Reese in terms of like, all right, what do my players do? Well, let's lean into that. And when your quarterback sees the game, the way that you see it as an offense coordinator, opposed to having to sort of hold his hand through the entire process, that, that just makes a huge difference. So I think, I think Parker will come off looking really good this year. Because of the quarterback, I think this would have been <laughs> Reese would have come off looking great this year because yeah. of the quarterback. Um, it just makes such a difference in terms of what you can achieve offensively. It's amazing what a throwing quarterback will do for you. I mean, yeah. and, and for the thought process to think that there was still a competition at the spring game was I kind of chuckled that. And after the third pass Sam Hartman threw, I think everybody was like, well, that's it. Tyler Buckner now yeah. was going to transfer, which he did. So the staying on the offensive side of the ball last year, you knew it was a shaky passing offense. You tried to rely on a, a crop of running backs and you knew if you had to throw the ball, it was to Michael Mayer who had 67 receptions and next closest was 30. So he's gone, but now we have a throwing quarterback. So who are the guys to rely on now for him to throw the ball to? That to me, the receiver position by far has been the biggest sort of like, I don't know if you'd call it a red flag or a question mark or a concern, whatever uh, you would want to describe it as like in camp, that position is just not kicked on the way I think the staff has wanted. Um, you know, we, we go out to practice and we're, we come out talking to like, Ooh, you know, Matt Salerno looks really good. Like, well, that's a, a former walk on six year senior, or there's, you know, true freshman Jaden Greathouse or Rico Flores might do some things like that's, that's not really how college football playoff rosters are built. Um, that you just are going to hope that three questions click to the positive for you at the position. And I, it really, to me, it's like if Tobias Merriweather can go from, the freshman that the staff wanted to start in November before he picked up the concussion to a 40, 50 catch receiver, which is a huge jump, but you watch him go through drills and you think, okay, there's gotta be a a high level, true number one receiver there, but we just haven't seen it in camp. Like that's, that's gotta be the in season development story that Notre Dame gets for it to, to really maximize its potential is Tobias Merriweather because they've got some nice complimentary parts. Jaden Thomas could be good. Chris Tyree could be good. But to me, it's Tobias Merriweather. That, that's the story that they really need to come through and come good this season for the offense to, to hit its maximum potential. I want to ask you about the the guard competition because I know Mike likes talking about the trenches. But first, I want to know, if I'm a fan and I have my pitchfork out, who am I blaming for – the struggles in recruiting at the wide receiver position and the fact that now it's like the second year in a row where we're going into the season, like who is the guy? We don't have a guy right now in that position group. 
Yeah, it's because it's you can't really blame Brian Kelly or Dell Alexander anymore. Like it's Marcus Freeman's program. He's got to he's got to own it. I know they didn't pick anybody up really in the portal. They, you know, I guess they got Caleb Smith from Virginia Tech. He sort of quit the team in in spring, but um, it's to me it just it it comes down to like can Chancey Stuckey, the receivers coach, and Tobias Merriweather get to a point where they. They, they get Tobias to, to show the potential that the staff believes that he has. Because like when you talk to the coaches in the summer, there really wasn't even a question about like, oh, Tobias Merriweather, can he or will he do it? They felt like this is going to happen. We haven't seen that. Um, that doesn't mean that it won't happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So I, I guess we, I mean, if, if, you want to have the pitchforks and torches for Brian Kelly just because it's like a, a default mechanism I, for Notre Dame fans? Yeah, I mean, I go for them. it. Why not? <laughs> Done. Why not? Just stick <laughs> stick with what was working. <laughs> All right. That's a, that's a great answer. Okay. So talk to me about the uh, competition right now at both guard positions. It seems like there are a couple guys or more than a couple guys in a couple spots, but no clear standout yet. Is that right? I think that's fair to say. Like they went into camp with Andrew Kristofik, who's a six-year senior, sort of like a Josh Lug type of player. Um, and then we all assumed, myself included, that Billy Shrouth, this sort of former national prospect, uh, who the, even the defensive linemen rave about on the team, would win the other guard spot. And then midway through the, you know, really the the hardcore training camp port of camp it's like well Rocco Spindler is actually running at the ones and Pat Coogan's running with the ones and you know Rocco Spindler was a former national prospect was I think only after Blake Fisher in his recruiting class in terms of the stature of prospect um, but just never really got on with Harry Heastand I don't think that they're they really saw eye to eye and then Pat Coogan was a, a guy out of Chicago Marist High School I believe who was I think when Notre Dame took him you're like okay Catholic school kid from Chicago, nice way to round out a class. And then lo and behold, a couple years later, he's running with the ones. And we asked Marcus Freeman about it on Saturday uh, when camp ended. And he didn't really have like a clear answer about what Coogan did to beat out Shrouth. But I think with Spindler, they just wanted more power at that position um, than maybe what Kristofik was giving them. So I think that they'll go with Coogan and Spindler to start. um, But I, but I do think Shrouth will have to play at some point this year. I just like there's there's just too much raw potential there for the staff not to try to turn it loose at least in some moments. Yeah, Spindler. I mean, listed at three twenty five, more of that hog in the middle. Because listen, I expect even though we have a passing quarterback now, teams will load up the box and say we're going to stop that running back room and force him to throw because there's no real proven receivers out there. So someone is going to have to step up and. They're going to all try and stop uh, Audric Estime, where if I were him, I would never wear a shirt in my life again because of that build. So let's let's go over to the defensive side where it seems, which is something I think Notre Dame hasn't seen in a while, you have depth at the defensive back position. I know the line has been looking really good as well, but th- that DB's room to be as d- seems to be as deeper than we had seen over some years. Corner in particular, like I, I think safety, they're they're short, like a, a high end. Like there's no Kyle Hamilton back right, at safety right. right now. But at corner, I mean, you think about, I mean, that the last time they played in Ireland, 2012, they go on to you know play for the title. That year was like Kavari Russell, freshman running back. Yeah. Hey, have you played corner before? <laughs> no. That's yeah. eh, you'll figure it out. It's fine. Like it's, it's, yeah. it shouldn't be that hard. And now, I mean, they are legit four corners deep. And they have two guys who can play the nickel and Thomas Harper and Clarence Lewis. Like it's a really, really good group. And then, you know, linebacker on top of that, um, it's Notre Dame has recruited well. They've developed even better with Ben Morris in there. Uh, you know, Cam Hart has some just crazy measurables. Um, so it's, that's that's sort of one of those things where like down the road against Ohio state, when Marvin Harrison comes to Notre Dame, or you're going against Caleb Williams in October, like, Notre Dame actually matches up with those kinds of teams now. And a year ago when they went out to USC, Tariq Bracey was hurt. Cam Hart was hurt. It felt like you were holding on for dear life in the secondary. Um, that shouldn't be the case this year. And I think that, that that should be pretty exciting for Marcus Freeman about how you build your defense. So as a former D lineman, let's talk about the most athletic players on the field, the D line. And 
who who fill, is there one person that fills that Foskey spot that that rusher that that guy that's going to put the pressure on the quarterback or is it going to be more by committee I think it's going to be by committee if they had another Foskey it wouldn't they just don't have that type of athlete right now where it's like there just aren't a lot of guys built like Isaiah Foskey with like that length and reach um, and quickness and so it's you know, whether it's Jordan Botello or Javante Jean-Baptiste on the other side or Nana Asafa Mensa, like they just they just need to have an adequate pass rush from the end position because I, I think they're two D tackles and they'll play four. I think that that's been one of the more positive surprises of camp that I, I think they'll be able to get some pass rush up the middle. Um, but off the edge, that's sort of where this defense maybe is missing that last piece to make it complete. Um, they have some guys who might get it done. Uh, but none of them have really done it consistently on the college level yet. All right, we might as well round this out with uh, talking about special teams now that we've done offense and defense. How How is Notre Dame going to replace Brian Mason? Will we get any um, nice trick plays on special teams this year or punt blocks? <laughs> Should we expect I, any of that? Yeah, maybe not seven punt blocks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what about eight? That, yeah, that'll be tough. But, I, you know, Marty Biagi certainly is aware of how Brian Mason was viewed by the Notre Dame fan base as like sort of the special teams wizard. So he may be out to try to like scheme something up that uh, turns into a little bit of a, like a, a identity or calling card, but you know, kicker Spencer Schrader from USF. I think he has a chance to be really, really good from what we've seen in camp so far. Um, you know, to the point where if it's, 45 yards and in you're you're confident Notre Dame's kicker is going to bang that through um so that's that's significant um you know what they do in punt return or or kickoff return it uh I think it'll probably be Chris Tyree at least at one of those roles um and then from there I it's just not a you know when last season started I don't think we were expecting seven pump blocks or even two pump blocks but uh they found a way to sort of make that a calling card of what they did so it will be I'll be curious to sort of see how that shakes out but just like the basics the kicking the punting Nordim should be in good shape with both of those So overall Pete I see the uh over under mostly on Notre Dame and wins is eight and a half where do you sit on that I'm over on that I you know I I think that they will win at least nine and they're more likely to win 10 than eight. Um, it's, I just think with like the difference that Sam Hartman can make at quarterback is like Notre Dame just hasn't. And I, I loved Ian book and what he did for Notre Dame and their career he had, but, and I've talked to Reese about this. It's just like, how often would, did you watch a game and think Ian book was the reason they won the game? Yeah. I'm not saying it never happened, right. but it wasn't a regular thing. Um, you know, maybe at North Carolina, uh, when they just, he, he really threw it all over there down there. But I think Sam Hartman has to be the, can be the reason they win Ohio state or they win USC, or maybe they win Clemson. And that's just, that's just a different world to live in for Notre Dame football, uh, with that kind of a quarterback. So maybe I'm putting too much on Sam Hartman. I don't think that I am, uh, with 110 career touchdown passes and, 13,000 yards at Wake Forest. Um, that's, but that's why I think they're more likely to win 10 than they are to win eight. And I, I would, I feel like hitting the over on that is, uh, if you're into that kind of thing, that's where I would lean. Well, I have one more non football uh, game related question, I guess you could say, which is something that I think I have seen more fans disappointed in than not disappointed in, which is the renewal of the Under Armour contract. Was there any sort of, reaction from players and coaches about the news that Notre Dame would be re-upping for 10 more years with Under Armour um, because I have to imagine if you're a cool kid you want Nike right yeah it's uh it was funny so Marcus got asked about that last weekend and Jack Swerberg is sitting in the room like what are you going to say about <laughs> it at that point <laughs> right. um and then he, Marcus was like, was like, my kids love Under Armour. We have all this free stuff around the house. Um, well, they get all the, the good Under Armour stuff that yeah, isn't even on the like, market. So that As a parent me. of a uh, 10-year-old boy, I can tell you that when we go shopping for back to school, Under Armour isn't like first on his list. So it, uh, the reaction has been what you think it would be, very measured. It doesn't really matter. It's fine. Um, and I think that's sort of all the players and coaches can say without talking to themselves into 
into some issues. Mm. <laughs> That's, you love you love when you hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. So this is uh, Jack Swarbrick's last, uh, really, in the beginning of next year. He's done as as AD, and he the one thing missing out of all the national titles is a Notre Dame football national title. What what are the odds you give that he can check that one off before he goes? Pretty long. Um, yeah. You know, it's like. I do. It's if they had, if you could magically get Isaiah Foskey back on the team, and then a Will Fuller, that's you know I, obviously asking a lot. Um, but I do think those are the pieces that they're missing to be like a. a they c- will contend for the playoff, I believe. But there's a as we've seen when Notre Dame makes it, there is a huge gap between making the playoff and winning the playoff, and I think that gap still exists for Notre Dame, where they they just don't have the complete roster to win it. Um, I do think they have enough material to contend to make it, but so I would not, uh, I would bet the over on eight and a half, but if you're asking me whether I would bet, that's like 14 wins. Um, that is, that to me would be a bridge too far for how this program's put together. Let's let's beat Stanford first. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the Marshall game wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Let's win the games we're supposed to win. So, so Pete, we appreciate the time and uh, look forward to seeing you in Ireland. Great stuff, Absolutely. Pete. Thanks, guys. And welcome back to Golik and Smeddy. As promised, joining us now, Rosie White, two-time Olympian, three-time Women's World Cup player for New Zealand, also played uh, in the National Women's Soccer League as well. And, Rosie, I know you've teamed up with some people and have a great message for us, and we're going to get to that. But let's start with the soccer. And first and foremost, how about having the World Cup in your backyard? How great is that? <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been pretty incredible. I've I've loved being back in New Zealand to experience the World Cup and see the whole country get behind it and it's been yeah, it's been absolutely incredible and I think everyone that I've talked to is pretty shocked at how successful it's been in New Zealand. It's been great. I've heard that the attendance records have shattered even what everyone expected them to be. What what are the ways that you feel like you've seen people get really behind uh, New Zealand and Australia as World Cup hosts? Is it just like pubs are packed, people are wearing jerseys in the streets? Like, what is the scene like there? Yeah, I mean, I think both of those things, um, you know, people are just excited about the games. Like, people that I know don't watch football or like football are talking to me. Sorry, soccer. Are talking to me about it. Non- <laughs> you, you can say football. It's okay. Yes, you can. We, I mean, we, we know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're um, stupid, but we're not that stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, you know, getting my ducks in a row. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, there's just been so much buzz about it. I mean, like on the news, on the street, everybody that I know has been talking to me about it that has never talked to me about soccer in my life. And like, this has been what I've done for a long time. Um, and just just the number of the and the crowds, like in New Zealand has never seen such huge crowds for soccer ever, you know? And I think in Australia as well, 75,000 people showing up to watch the Matildas play. Like it's pretty... Um, I think it's it's changing the way that people think about soccer in this part of the world. So it's pretty pretty epic. Yeah, it, it's been great, as you mentioned, attendance. Now, here in the States, it's a little tougher with the time of day. Some of the games are on. But, again, being in where you grew up and now everybody kind of coming there, do you find yourself, I don't know how much players do on the off days, being a tour guide to players and uh, showing them you know, things to do and where to go? Um, yeah, I've definitely gone to see a lot of the players that have come through uh, Auckland, where I'm based, um, and families have been reaching out to me just to be like, what do we do? What do we... Unfortunately, it's the middle of winter in New Zealand, so it's not like oh. prime time <laughs> to be hanging out here. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's been, I mean, it's been so fun to have the best soccer in the world in my city that I grew up in, um, pretty like bizarre and, and strange. Um, but no, it's been a lot of fun. What do you think is next for the New Zealand team? They made history at this World Cup, and we're, we obviously on the states in the states have been disappointed with the way the U.S. Women's National Team crashed out in the in the round of 16. But I think it seems like there's been a different kind of atmosphere around New Zealand in the way that like everyone's rallied around uh, New Zealand in the group stage. Yeah, um, I think what's been so interesting about this whole World Cup is just the 
the quality of play across the board. Um, you know, the US bowing out early in the World Cup is is like super disappointing, obviously, for American fans. But I think it is a testament to the quality that everybody else is bringing. All these European teams are playing so well. And I think just women's soccer in general is just growing so much internationally. And, you know, for New Zealand, um, winning a game at a World Cup was like the initial goal because that had never happened before. And um, so it was pretty special to be part of that. And it was obviously the first game in the World Cup. So that was like definitely, I think, a big reason why New Zealanders got behind and like wanted to support. Um, And, you know, they also like had the potential to go through the group stages and didn't didn't quite get there and so there's like always heartbreak and it's a roller coaster you know you get so excited and then your heart breaks and then you do it all over again so um yeah it's been it's been super fun I think for New Zealand fans to to see what this sport is is really like at the best level so down to the semis now Spain and Sweden Australia and England getting ready to play and as, as Jess mentioned as we all know here in the states we've had uh, the World Cup champs, the last two World Cups in our U.S. women's national team. And I wonder the, the thought of players, former players, because how we do it in the States is people are built up to a high level and then you can't wait to see them crash and burn. That's, that's an idiotic thing we do in the States. Obviously, for our national team, we don't wish that to happen. But I'm wondering other teams around the world or other players around the world, are they are they glad kind of the U.S. team – kind of lost like earlier than they ever have in this tournament before is there a little bit of yeah yeah you're not so high and mighty now <laughs> I don't want to get myself into trouble but I think um there I mean there they definitely I've seen other players talking about the US team and you know it is so easy to um I don't know it's so easy to pull apart a team that is on at the highest peak you know it's so easy to criticize um And obviously, like, I I think, you know, the U.S. has this, like, something about them. They've been at the top for so long. They, you know, carry this confidence with around with them. And I think that's probably a part of why they've been so good. Um, And that definitely, like, has the potential to rub other players the wrong way. And so I think, you know, watching the way that it's everything's unfolded, there probably is a little bit of, like, okay, cool. Like, it's time for a new champion. (laughs) Like, let's go. Um, but I, I mean, I think the most exciting thing is that, like, there isn't just one dominating force in this sport anymore. Like, that is sick. If you think about it from, a, like, a, a world perspective, it's it's more competitive than it ever has been. And there's more teams that are playing for the trophy. And you have four new contenders that don't have their name on the World Cup trophy. So I think that's that's pretty epic. You know, it's not just the U.S. is going to win. Like, don't need to watch. <laughs> Well, not to get you into trouble, but I know you've played for Vladko Andonovsky before. You have, I, I assume, somewhat of a relationship with him from playing on OL Reign, but um, it does not seem like the US, U.S. soccer is going to retain him. His contract's up at the end of the year, and I think fans were really disappointed, and, and there was a lot of finger-pointing his way. Did you have any sort of take on the way that the U.S. women's team was managed or any sort of... Uh, take away from how maybe things could turn around for us in the next cycle, hopefully. Yeah. Um, I mean, after kind of like having a few conversations with some of the players and I don't know, from what I observed, it seemed like there was like a lot of different things that were playing a part in, uh, you know, potentially not performing to the level that they wanted to, especially in the group stage. Um, I mean, I don't know when you look at like statistically, like subs that are made um, the teams that make the most subs are usually the more successful. And I don't think the U S made very many subs at all during the group stages. So, I mean, maybe that was part of it. Um, It's pretty hard to imagine a team with that much talent, not like performing the way they want to. You saw like, I mean, I think their last game was their best performance for sure. Um, But throughout the group stages, it was kind of like, they didn't really ever get into fifth gear. Um, and that's the nature of sport. Like, if you're not performing, then the coach gets the, the blame and you, you move on. And obviously, they have to change something to um, to retain their, like, status as the best team in the world. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that means the coach changes. Some A lot of things will probably change, um, I imagine, so that they can get back to where they want to be um, on top of the world. <laughs> Yeah, I I, listen, completely agree. I said it before. His contract's, I think, up at the end of the year, and I think he'll be gone before that. 
because uh, we do have the Olympics to get ready for uh, next year and then obviously the next World Cup. And, and, and I'm wondering, Rosie, it is you know, so the, the women's team has been on, on top for a while now. Is part of this, while they did have some new players this year, how much of it is the rest of the world is, is basically is catching up? The talent level is, is spread more evenly now around the world. I think that's that's probably the biggest factor more than anything else. Um, you know, I think it's the European teams and leagues around around are like are the best potentially the best places to be playing, the most competitive. Um, I think it's what's so great about it is it forces everybody to be better. It forces the NWSL to be better. Um, you know, better contracts, more sponsors, everything the level will just be forced to to grow and develop so i think um for sure that's probably the biggest contributing factor is like there's players all around the world that are pushing the level um and it's not just coming from the us anymore which is which is great it forces them to be better it forces everybody else to be better so of the four teams left, Spain, Sweden, Australia, and England, it seems like most people are now backing the Matildas to win because, you know, it's their home World Cup. It would be an incredible story. And they have one of the best players in the world, Sam Kerr, on their team who has tons and tons of fans. But can you make a case for why maybe we should be rooting for one of the other three teams in the semifinals? Um, I honestly think that anybody could take it from here. Um, I think all four teams have the ability to, um, I, I'm, I'm hoping for a, a Spain Australia final. Um, I think the Spanish have been so exciting and fun to watch. They're so creative and the players that they have at the attacking third are just like Bon Matty is, is just like outrageous, I think. Um, so I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm like backing the Australians, which is really weird to do as a New Zealander. Like that's like sacrilegious, but I, <laughs> I can find them to win. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think the Spanish have been super exciting. I mean, I think England hasn't really gone into fifth gear either. So if they show up against Australia, that's going to be fun to watch. I was shocked when, when Sweden beat uh, Japan the other day. That was definitely for me. I, 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 w I went from I'm all in on the U.S. to I'm all in on Nigeria beating England. Then that went to penalties and they lost. And then I was like, okay, now I'm a fan of J Japan. And then they lost to Sweden too. So I, every team that I get behind loses their next game. So I'm going to not root for anyone because I'm afraid of jinxing Australia. Um, my last question for you, since you have played in the NWSL, I'm wondering – um, if you think the U.S. Women's National Team not being as successful as they hope to be in this World Cup, if that has any sort of impact on the NWSL. Um, I know like the Women's Super League is very popular and some of the best players in the world are hoping to play there. And there's also a ton of amazing talent in the NWSL. But obviously, after this huge disappointment, do you think it's going to impact at all where players want to play and how they want to view like playing in a club team to make the national team in the U.S.? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it probably has an impact. Um, I don't know what that exactly looks like, but, um, you know, I think traditionally the U.S. players have, have played in the NWSL. You don't, I think it's only Lindsay Horan that doesn't play in the NWSL um, as like a pathway to to being on the national team. So I don't know if that changes. I think the the biggest thing is that like it definitely like puts the pressure on the NWSL to to be better and to be stronger um so that they can develop players that are competing um on the world stage like and winning on the world stage. Um so I, I mean I wonder I wonder what the what the ramifications are. I think it definitely poses the question to players like is this the best place for me to be? Um, and I hope that that means that there's a reaction from the clubs to be like, okay, we need better contracts, we need better players, we need more international players playing in the NWSL. Um, so I think it, you know, it, it's definitely like a challenge for the NWSL, and I think the players will be in the back of their heads thinking like, where is the best place for me to be if I want to be the best player in the world? Well, Rosie, listen, we, we love talking sports. It's what we do. And, but at the end of the day, it, it is a game. You know, it is a game, uh, though it's obviously a, a business in some aspects as well, but it's a game. But you have, you have a much more important message, I think, that you want to get out to people. 
Yeah. Um, well, thank you for, for having me and, and giving me this time and space. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm here on behalf of Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, I'm speaking about um, ulcerative colitis, which is um, a disease that I, I've had for my entire career. Um, I was diagnosed with it when I was like 18 at UCLA playing soccer. Um, and for me, I didn't know anything about ulcerative colitis. Um, I'd never heard of it before. Um, and I think a lot of people haven't. Um, and I, and the supporting you with UC campaign that we're working on is basically just creating a space for patients and families to find resources, um, and, um, learn how to talk to their doctors to find the best treatment option for them. Um, and for me, you know, it, it was a huge hindrance on the way that I was able to compete professionally and um, internationally. Um, and for healthy people, it's very weird to be dealing with a, a chronic condition. Um, so the website is supporting you with uc.com um, and it hosts a lot of really awesome information about what colitis is, um, how to find treatment options that work for you. Um, and for family members as well to learn like how to understand it and ask ask questions because um, it's it can be it can be scary and um, it's it's really hard to talk about because it's awkward and and no one wants to talk about that sort of stuff but um, yeah I, I, I feel really grateful to have been working on it with them and um, I think it's an important message not only for ulcerative colitis but for any other illness to learn how to talk about it and deal with it and educate yourself on it um, so I, I'm, I'm really happy to be working on that. Well, I mean, it, it's great we, you, to try and help people get past the awkward stage because you're right. That is sometimes the biggest part of it is it, it's an awkward conversation, but it's one to get out in the open and have to help people. So we really appreci appreciate you doing that. I, we do have to ask, since Jess and I are both grads of Notre Dame, she in 2016, me in 1985, so I'm a really old man. Did you play against <laughs> Notre Dame at all at UCLA and how did you do? We d I we did play against Notre Dame once I think at a tournament um, at Duke and we smashed them. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! That was the wrong answer. <laughs> We're gonna have to check that, Jess. We are gonna have to check that. I think. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna. I'm like googling it right now. I was like, okay, I think that was like in 2014. I want to say I'm gonna go find this. Oh now. my gosh, that's yeah, awesome! I genuinely don't. Even, I genuinely don't even remember. But I feel like we did play them once. <laughs> we are gonna definitely look that up, Rosie. And, and we <laughs> we really appreciate uh, appreciate your time very much. And uh, it's been it's been even though you know, listen, our our, our American mm -hmm. women's team is is not in it. It's been fun to watch. It's been great to see. Uh, the, the fans and, and everything and the, the backing of it. Uh, so very cool. So we, we look forward to these, uh, these semifinals and finals. Thank you for your time. Yeah, awesome. And, and the U.S. Women's National Team is still absolute legends. They have, you know, that they, they've made this game what it is, and those players are so iconic. So I hope that everybody just keeps supporting them because they, they'll be back stronger than ever. And I think, um, you know, that with, this game has so much to – to be grateful for for that team in particular um they are they're like still the ultimate you know they'll come back and i think we can't be we can't we can't be putting them down because they are legends okay mike we have half of the world cup final set spain and sweden played this morning at 4 a.m i watched the whole game it was uh, not very exciting until maybe the last oh. like 30 minutes. And then all of a sudden there were three goals at right at the end of the game. Um, and England and Australia, I'm wearing a, a brand new Australia uh, women's soccer jersey. Not sure if you noticed. Uh, I will be standing them tomorrow. They play tomorrow and the winner will play Spain. So this is a, this is not the World Cup final that I was expecting, but it's no. been a fun tournament. I don't think a lot of people were expecting this. And you, you're right about the, the Spain and Sweden match. I mean, this was 81st minute, you got the first goal. And then between the 81st minute and 89th minute, you got a total of three goals. So all of a sudden it was going along, it, going along, and then boom, <laughs> you know, it was, it was goal heaven. Yeah, the back-to-back -back scoring was pretty pretty jarring because all of a sudden Sweden tied it up and you thought, tied okay, it up, well, yeah. another freaking game is going to extra time, which yep. I know like – Fans who are watching in the States who have been getting up early 
are like expecting to get up, watch the game, maybe go back to sleep. But then so many of these early games have gone into, you know, 120 minutes of play and then penalties that yeah. lasts until everyone else wakes up. And then you just have nothing to do other than go get a coffee and start your day. So it has, there has been a lot of extra time in the World Cup. Yeah, luckily not on this one. I mean, you're right. Sweden going nuts, tying it up 1-1 so late, getting close to the end of regulation before whatever, you know, added time, injury time is going to be added. But then Spain scores right away in that 89th minute uh, to put it away 2-1. to one. That What a letdown for Sweden. That had to be. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'm with you. I, you know what? I, I've said it before, and I know we, the U.S. women's team, lost on penalty kicks and I, and I said it then, I'll say it now. I, I would have said it even if we won on penalty kicks. I'm not a fan of that. I'm glad this didn't go to it. Certainly you go through two 15-minute periods before you get to penalty kicks. So there is time to get it done on the field. But I wish it would always be like that. But congrats to Spain. And I'm with you. I'm pulling for Australia over England uh, in the next semifinals. And then, you know, we'll see where it all leads. But um, you can say... As far as overall, that the this women's World Cup has been nothing short of a success, right? I mean, with oh, the sure. eyes that have been on it, the 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 attendance that has gone on it. I, listen, I understand we wanted our women to win it for the third straight uh, World Cup. That didn't happen, but that that doesn't take away. I mean, while I would imagine eyes in the United States turned off the World Cup for good, right? And weren't going to get up at 3 in the morning or 4 in the morning or 5 <laughs> in the morning and watch the games like you or I would, uh, that they were just done with it because our women were out of it. And I get it. I'm, I would never criticize those people. That's, that's fine. And, and the time difference really got us with where it is this year between Australia and, and New Zealand. But it, it, it has been nothing short of an incredible success. Yeah, absolutely. There's been some great soccer. I think what's interesting about Spain making it this far is the amount of of like drama that their team had heading into the World Cup. A bunch of players last summer wrote a letter to the Sp or earlier this year, I should say, wrote a letter to the Spanish Federation um, about not wanting to play for the coach that is the coach of the Spanish national team. Some of those players ended up, you know, reconciling and are now on the team. Some of them stayed home. So some of Spain's best women soccer players did not even play in this tournament. And for them to make the final in spite of all of that is really just mind boggling, especially because earlier in the tournament, they lost four to zero to Japan and Japan was considered a heavy favorite uh, after the U.S. went out to win the whole tournament. Then they were knocked out by Sweden, Sweden who yeah. also knocked out the U.S. And now Sweden has been knocked out by Spain. So it's like this weird uh, connection there. So yeah, I don't, I don't really know who had Spain in the final on their, you know, in their pre world cup bracket pool. I certainly did not, but I think it'll be really cool. They have a really cool, talented young star, uh, who came in and scored two goals, one late against the Netherlands and one in this game as a sub, uh, Selma Pariolo. She is super exciting to watch. So keep an eye on her. Pariolo. I, I, sorry about yeah. that. You know, a what, what, listen, I, you, I'm glad you tried it, <laughs> not me. So um, one of the things that's interesting, and this, this is more in a broader sense, you mentioned that, that some, some were wanted this manager ousted, but then end up going back to the team, reconciling. It's almost like you tried to get him out and then it didn't work and now you got to go play for th Listen, this has happened in sports here in America, when someone's involved in trade talks, there's bad blood going back and forth, and all of a sudden you're put back together again. Yeah. It, it's got to be weird. When it you is say, weird, yeah. Yeah, when you say reconciling, you're like, oh, God, I'm in a bad spot here. You know, we better work things out so there could, you, there could be some compatibility. Yeah, I think Rosie said she wanted a Spain-Australia final, so we may get that. We certainly, half of that is is. Yep pending now but uh we'll see how australia does against england tomorrow all right so we have that coming up and tell me jess when do we get more formula one going i know they're on break right now <laughs> and there's there during the season there had been a couple of breaks obviously some for horrible reasons uh that, that we know that are far more important but that certainly this season seems a little more scattershot and now we're on yeah. break when, when can we I, get some racing 
I love how mad that you're getting oh. about the the Formula One calendar. This this is a scheduled break. This is not due to like flooding or Whatever. cancellations or anything. All the Formula One drivers get a little mini three week vacation in August and post on their Instagrams pictures of them on yachts and traveling the world and not driving cars. So for a lot of people, like this is our Super Bowl. This is the poster Super Bowl. We get to see what everyone's up to. There's always like some nice you know off track drama that happens but it's been a very quiet year in f1 in terms of like things happening outside of the races so i don't know i'm maybe i'm thinking the last half of the season is going to be a little bit more dramatic to make up for it all i have to say is when they get three weeks off or if you and i got three weeks off there would be really different pictures that would be taken i don't think we're (laughs) going to be on yachts you know in in a private island i know that would be that would be so nice amazing vacations like it is the life it looks like it is the life but you know next week we will be in ireland and i look forward to what goodies you're going to be making out there for us to eat i'm supposed to bake something